afternoon's a distinguished uh, lecture series organized by the Confucius Institute uh, at Rutgers University. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Wilt uh, Idema. Professor Idema is currently Professor of Chinese Literature and Chairman in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at Harvard University. Uh, however, prior to coming to the United States, uh, he spent most of his professional career in Holland at Leiden University, where he received his PhD in 1974 with a thesis on the early history of Chinese literature, uh, <laughs> uh, early vernacular, uh, formative period of the uh, vernacular Chinese literature. Uh, he was full professor uh, of Chinese language and literature from 1976 to 1999, when he retired from his position and wasted no time to find a new employer so in Harvard. Uh, Professor Idema's research interests are primarily in late imperial Chinese literature, in particular vernacular fiction, drama, and performative literature from the 13th century to the late, interior, uh, late imperial period. However, he is also as distinguished, uh, as a, he, has a, he has distinguished himself as literary historian and translator of pre-northern Chinese literature into English and Dutch. Among his many monographs and translations are, just a short list, the Dramatic Earth of Zhu Yodun, The Moon and the Sitter, The Story of the Western Ring, a very important translation of that uh, masterwork within the uh, dramatic tradition of China. The Red Brush, Writing Women of Imperial China, uh, authored to, uh, together with the other grant on the women's literature uh, through, the, uh, through the ages. And uh, Meng Jianyu brings down the Great Wall, 10 versions of a Chinese legend, uh, extremely important uh, legend within Chinese tradition that can be followed up uh, through, again, to the various dynasties. Uh, Professor Idema's talk today will draw on his most recent, or one of his most recent publications, uh, namely Judge Bao and the Rule of Law, Eight Ballad Stories from the Period 1250 to 1450. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Idema to Rutgers. Peter, thank you very much for your very kind introduction, and I would like to thank all my colleagues here for inviting me to Rutgers University. Uh, as a Dutchman, of course, one almost feels at home <laughs> walking across the campus, seeing the statue of William the Silent. The Dutch are weird people. They must have been the only leader of a revolution who did not say a word. <laughs> but uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to uh, be allowed to give this uh, talk. And don't have your expectations too high up because, as was pointed out just to me just a moment ago, your handout starts with a mistake. So what can you expect? The uh, handout, it's of course about Judge Pao and not about Emperor Pao. Uh, so if that's the quality of my scholarship, <laughs> do please uh, be kind uh, to me. Uh, the first thing, of course, I have to uh, stress is that I am not a legal scholar. Uh, I could have been a legal scholar when I started out in Chinese studies, Leiden University at that moment probably was the only university in the world outside the uh, China itself which had a chair in Chinese law. That was a remnant of the Dutch colonial past because the Chinese community in the Dutch East Indies, nowadays Indonesia, was governed as much as possible as far as its internal problems were concerned according to Chinese law and custom which meant that officials for Chinese affairs and of course the study of Chinese language and culture at Leiden University was established to train colonial officials for uh, service in the colonies had to know Chinese law. And so Holland has a long tradition in that respect of a study of Chinese law. 
and when I came to Leiden University as a student in 1963, uh, Van der Valk was still teaching as professor of Chinese law, and as a freshman I indeed went to his classes. There were three students in his class, and he assumed that you had a basic knowledge of Dutch law and a very sound knowledge of Chinese, and he taught, his topic he discussed was the unlawful action in Dutch, in Chinese law. To this very day, I have no clue <laughs> about that uh, class, and I dropped out after three sections. Uh, but it is an aspect of uh, Dutch Sinological Studies, uh, which has found its reflections both in the research of my own teacher, Anthony Hulseway, who was a specialist on the law of the Han Dynasty and of the Qin Dynasty. And of course, it's reflected in the writings of another famous Dutch sonologist, Van Gulik, in his Judge D novels. And one of my first uh, published articles in English was The Mystery of the Halved Judge D novel, which dealt with Van Gulik's partial translation of the four strange cases in the reign of Empress Wu, which he translated as Ti Kung An, and which became the model for his own type of uh, Chinese-style uh, detective novels. Uh, of course, the moment when I was a student was not exactly the right time to become interested in Chinese law because a few years into my studies, the People's Republic of China decided to abolish all law as a bourgeois uh, invention, and we entered a number of years of uh, uh, revolutionary justice and uh, it's a period which is now remembered in somewhat different terms than what it was described when it was actually in place. It was a time when Judge Pao was vilified as a very, very bad man. Uh, this was the, the Cultural Revolution was the time when the so-called pure officials, and Judge Pao is one of the most famous examples of that category, were decried as about the most evil representatives of the feudal ruling class. And why? Because by suggesting that justice was obtainable in individual cases, they created a smokescreen that hid the true nat nature of class rule. And so you can have cruel landlords and bullies and you know immediately their true nature as class oppressors, but when it comes to these pure officials, they hold out this false hope of justice in a class society and therefore they have to be condemned so much more strictly than uh, these other uh, bullies. So my early years in Chinese studies were not the period to start the study of Chinese law or Judge Pao. But of course, after the Cultural Revolution, Judge Pao has made a great uh, comeback. He is, again, a highly popular figure. The grave that had been desecrated during the Cultural Revolution has been restored. The temple to Judge Pao in Hefei has been restored. Temples to Judge Pao have been restored all over China. And of course, TV series about Judge Pao have a pan-Chinese appeal. Uh, I think the a Taiwanese Judge Pao series was one of the first Taiwanese TV series that was a big hit.